let's open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 21 verse 6. The Bible is the Word of God. We believe that it was written with uh, many authors, about 60 something uh, authors in the span of, uh, or 40 something authors in the span of 1,500 years. But the unity in the Bible and uh, all of these historical things in the Bible, all of these also proofs in the Bible, prove to us and Bible itself that it's the written Word of God. We trust in it, lean our salvation on it. And right now we will take a moment and read a verse from the Old Testament, first book of the Old Testament named Genesis. Genesis means beginning. 21 verse 6 and Sarah said God has made me laugh some people don't think God can make people laugh people think comedians make people laugh but Sarah discovered God to make her laugh now not because God told her a joke not because God showed her a funny video of how Adam and Eve were running around in the garden and no one was looking and they didn't have clothes God has made me laugh it wasn't because God said something that was humorous worthy of laugh but because of what God did and all who hear will laugh with me you know actually a statistic says and I don't know how they measure this that a child laughs 150 times a day an adult 15 times a day the older you get less you laugh and you maybe will you look at me and say well I get more responsible it's true that's why no wonder Jesus says we have to be more like children sometimes laughter is good Bible says it does good as medicine laughter can actually bring emotional mental and physical healing to your life the more you have it in your life but in here Sarah was not watching comedy in here what is talking about is this is that Sarah had a problem and she wanted to have children now children to have children today we have 50 million children unfortunately they were aborted people don't want kids today they feel like getting rid of kids is helping them to find their freedom in the cultures in those days in the cultures in in Africa in Middle East to have a child is better than to win a lottery to, have, to not have a child is to live like in curse. It's a really shameful thing for a woman there. And here is Sarah. She wants to have a child and she cannot have a child. And then she gets a child at a very old age when she is very, 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 very old. And when she gets the child, God says, I want you to call this child Isaac. Now you're going to learn Hebrew today. You know what Isaac means? Laughter. So if somebody says, what are you doing? You say, I'm Isaacing. <laughs> I'm just laughing. <laughs> but instead of sending LOL, you can just send Isaac. <laughs> God says, I want you to call your child Isaac. Why do you have to call your child Isaac? Because I want you, every time you call your son, I don't want you to call him, you know, Karalito, Pushkin, I don't want you to call him Juan, I don't want you to call him Vlad, I want you to call him anytime you even bring up his name, I want you to remind yourself you have a reason to laugh because of what I did in your life. This kind of a laughter is what God wants to bring into your life. I'm not talking about when you laugh because you feel funny. You laugh because something is funny. You laugh because some people are funny. But you laugh in your life because you cried too long. You waited too long and God finally brought the breakthrough you wanted. And now you can laugh. Can somebody say amen? amen. We all need God to make us laugh in a sense to do things in our life we always wished always dreamed of other people got it somehow just right away but for you it doesn't come naturally and when God comes in and does it for you that miracle will make you laugh maybe today you're not laughing you're crying every day or maybe every time the problem comes up or every time you get reminded once again of what's going on in your life and you cry at night maybe you cry in the morning but I want to tell you something the God we serve wants to turn your mourning into dancing your weeping into joy the Bible says weeping may last for the night but the joy comes in the morning that means our God wants to do things in our lives so incredible that will put a smile on our face and will make us laugh 
every single day and when people hear about it they'll laugh with you too this is not just giggles when you heard Nehemiah sharing the testimony about being healed of asthma I was laughing not laughing at him but smiling it brings you joy when we heard last week of people who had back problems and they went to the doctors and they didn't find those problems they had in their backs you know it gives you a laughter it gives you this joy it puts a smile on your face I always love to watch my pastor when testimonies are given at church he has the most priceless physical facial expression on testimonies sometimes we just wanted to capture it because it expresses a heart that rejoices in what God is doing after you witness of what God maybe has not been doing what the devil's been doing and then you finally see what God is doing it gives you a sense of laughter Abraham is one of the best examples of what it is to be a Christian from the Old Testament because Abraham received righteousness by faith righteousness means like salvation Abraham didn't receive didn't become righteous because he did something but because he believed in God and the Bible says it was accounted to him for righteousness just like us we are righteous because God gives us that as a gift Abraham also did not have a physical Bible yet Abraham had a voice he knew the voice of God so good that God could communicate back and forth with Abraham and Abraham had no physical church Abraham had no pastor and Abraham had no Bible the, the generation we live in today especially us as Christians we have a little problem because we have a church we have a pastor we have a podcast we have the Christian radio show we have a Christian TV shows we have Christian bumper stickers we have Christian t-shirts we have so much of these things but many times young people do not know the voice of God they know the word of God they have it on their phone they have it on their bookshelf but to know God's voice to be able to have a relationship with him that does not depend on what I heard when I was six years of age when I went to a Catholic school to know God's voice that does not depend on this is what my grandma took to this boring church when I was five and that's when I rose my hand and gave my life to Jesus Abraham had a relationship with God that was not based on just a book it was also based it was so real and authentic Abraham could say God and God says Abraham that is the relationship that you and I have to dream to live in every single day of our life if Abraham could do that without knowing the Holy Spirit we can sure have that and even more having the Holy Spirit inside of us can somebody say amen? amen Abraham not only he talked to God the Bible says he walked with God that's a different relationship when you walk with someone when you develop that closeness with someone Abraham is who I want to be like he is our father in the faith he is the example of what it's like to walk in the faith. God called Abraham for the first time. He says, I want you to get out of your city and I want you to go to a different country and I will show you that country. And Abraham begins to take those steps of obedience to God, obedience in faith and begins to learn how to walk by faith. Today, studying life of Abraham, we will just take few simple nuggets from his life in hopes to provide nutrients to our own faith and to our own relationship with God somebody said amen. amen if you're taking notes I want you to write down the first thing is that great faith does not have a great beginning or a great start a great faith does not have a great start so many times when you begin something we have this idea that for it to succeed it has to have a really good beginning the enemy will lie to us and tell us because you have a rough start you will also have a rough ending but the bible is full of stories left and right of people who started really bad and who ended really good and actually the bible discourages people who start good and finish bad 
that's why if you are here today and you had a rough beginning maybe you had a rough 15 years of your life a rough 20 years of your life because of things that didn't happen or happened in your life I gotta tell you something your whole life is not crossed off because the whole point of the gospel is you can have a bad beginning and end with a great ending Jesus is the finisher he's the author and the finisher of our faith if you had a bad chapter you don't have to have a bad book because of Christ can somebody say amen see Abraham finished his faith with laughing because of what God did but he started his faith with laughing when God said you will have a son and Abraham went <laughs> that's a joke he was laughing at God when God said something so outside of this world so here is a man who is the father of faith who is laughing because God is doing such a great things but his faith started with laughing mocking God and saying that's completely ridiculous God you don't make mistakes but I am your first mistake <laughs> you did you're not speaking to the right person you misdialed the number God that's not me I am an old man I won't have children you know what the first thing you have to overcome in your faith is your own laughter of unbelief you will laugh at some things God will tell you when God will tell you you're successful but the only thing you experienced is failure and it's an inside laugh it's the thing that says you're right mm -hmm. of course oh yeah that's right mm -hmm. it's the mocking laugh if you overcome that your faith already has a good beginning if you are here today and you may be laughing at God's promises and your own dreams you're in a good company Abraham was here also I remember when many years ago my pastor would speak to me and tell me in his van he would tell me that God will use you God will do great things to you and you will preach and you will speak at big conferences and we will have revival and you will actually preach in English you will do more than stealing bicycles from Goodwill on Saturday. <laughs> your life has purpose. Your life has meaning. And I remember I would be sitting there and I'm listening. But inside, I was laughing. I was like, he has no idea. I have no desire to preach. I don't like to preach. That is not my thing. And I'm sitting there. But I'm, I'm outside. I'm looking. Oh good. Oh, mm, 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 mm. I try not to say anything. So he doesn't keep going more and more and more. But inside I'm laughing. And I'm like this is not right. This is not going to happen. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know my problems. He doesn't know my insecurities. He doesn't know. I don't have anything. I don't know what he sees. I don't know why he's saying these things. But he was speaking that. And my faith was like that. I was laughing because I didn't believe God could use me you know Abraham had to overcome another laugh when he finally got a little baby named Isaac and another big baby named Ishmael was laughing at Isaac and said you think you're gonna be the right man who will inherit everything and when Abraham saw that he says you're not gonna laugh at my promise and he drove him away the first laughter you have to overcome is the laughter of your own unbelief the second laughter is the laughter of people who are close to you who laugh at your vision laugh at your commitment to God well you're gonna get baptized in that church well you, you you think that you're just gonna simply rise up you think you're gonna be the first one to finish school we all in our family broke every marriage is destroyed and that's exactly how you're gonna be oh you gotta go to the doctor get checked in I know you're 25 but we all have cancer you gotta go check in because it's not gonna pass you by and when people begin to laugh at your idea at your vision for your life and this is the moment where you have to protect your vision and not protect the opinions of people because the last time I checked you cannot pay your bills with the opinions of people can somebody say amen when Jesus walks into the room and there is a dead girl that's laying out there and people start the Bible says they were mocking and laughing Jesus why because Jesus walks into the room and he says the girl is not dead they're like we checked her pulse she is he said nope 
Jesus you're not a doctor you're a carpenter how do you know she's not dead she's sleeping how dare you say that who you think you are you think you're a doctor why are you saying that and the Bible says they were laughing at him they were mocking him and what I love about Jesus is you didn't try to convince them debate them he said hey guys there's four exit doors which one do you like that one this one that one or that one please choose one every person who laughs at the things God is dealing and working with you you have to nicely and politely show them the exit if you surround yourself with those people or because they're famous or because they're rich and they're connected and you try to simply please them and you give up your dream to please those people you're the most miserable person Tri-Cities has ever had walk on its soil people pleasers will never achieve anything in life protect your dream against your own laugh and against the laughs of people who are close to you people you might respect who will not understand what God is doing and what God wants to do in your life can somebody say amen and you know then then God will reward you with the laughter where now people will laugh with you not mockingly or in unbelief but they will come to you and they say we always knew you can succeed we always knew you had it in you oh, we saw that in you when you were a little boy you're like really that's why you threw the stones that's why you gossip that's why you criticize that's why you pushed me down they will always say oh we always believed you we always we always knew you're very special like it's interesting that I never heard that from you until I actually now have an Isaac in my hands overcome the laughter of your unbelief overcome the laughter of people's unbelief and only then God will bless you with the laughter of your success with the laughter of your healing with a laughter of a happy marriage with a laughter of your new life can somebody say amen can somebody say amen, amen. does anybody want to be made laugh by God <laughs> God will make you laugh Abraham teaches us that when Abraham receives a promise from God and he begins to laugh first he overcomes that laughter but Abraham has this person in his life named Lot and he only hears the promise of God this is who he's gonna be but he doesn't see that promise and he doesn't speak that promise yet and then what God does is God brings Abraham a little bit further and says Abraham I know that you have been the person who has heard my promise you have heard the things that I said but Abraham I want you not only hear what I tell you I want you to begin to see what I tell you and I want you to begin to speak what I tell you see God's promise has to lead us to vision and then the vision will lead us to faith write this down God's promise has to lead me to a vision and vision has to lead me to faith God's promise has to also change what I see God's promise has to change what I speak and Abraham was simply the one who heard the promise of God heard the promise of God but he was not seeing the promise of God and he wasn't speaking the promise of God until God removed a very interesting person in his life it was his nephew Lot word Lot means veil that means that Abraham was only hearing God's promise but he wasn't able to see the vision until God had to remove the veil and when the veil was removed Lot then the Bible says Abraham God told Abraham look Abraham see everything I'm giving this to you and he began to see and walk and then God changed his name it's important that we take the promise of God from our ears into our eyes and from our eyes into our mouth for many people the promise of God of healing remains in their ears by his stripes I am healed that's what God's word says but do you see yourself healthy do you see yourself no longer that person that you are today do you see yourself the way God says or do you still see yourself well God says this but I see myself this way do you speak according to what you see that is the really the dilemma of faith faith grows when we go from hearing God's promise to seeing that promise and then taking that promise into our mouth and letting it affect our speech and our confession that's exactly what happened to Abraham 
Abraham started to move on God removes the veil and sometimes there are people in our life that are like a veil as long as you have them there's going to be one thing you will have a blurred vision I always say this you cannot have drama and dreams in your life at the same time if you allow drama people in your life and, and I know some people they're so good if we could open a TV station I could fill them with the reality TV show just put cameras on their back and their life is just literally perfectly organized drama life some people are anointed they're drama queens everywhere they walk in there is going to be drama there's going to be conflict there's going to be gossip there's going to be problems there's going to be issues and that's who Lot was Lot was a drama person where he, everywhere he would walk in there will be problems and Abraham the moment he noticed the drama the, mom, the moment he noticed the strife Abraham said hey Lot let's simply uh, let, let's take a distance you go there God bless you yeah take the flocks you go and I'm just going to simply stay here if you want to live by vision you have to protect your vision from drama or people who create it sometimes it could be a boyfriend or a girlfriend a person who keeps getting starting a relationship and ending a relationship five times in one day kick the joker in his curb and get rid of him block his number and get a restraining order this drama is not going to help your vision sometimes it's certain co-workers certain friends that we have that abuse and drain us emotionally or certain situations that drain us emotionally people who have blur vision usually have a lot in their life people who say man my vision is, seems to die all the time God wants to remove a veil he wants to remove certain drama causing issues or places in your life so you can have a good vision in your life if you have an emotional vampire hanging around your life somebody who continuously sucks life sucks energy and sucks good positivity out of your life I have a news for you you will either keep lot or keep vision but you won't have a dream and lot in the same house living because lot will eat your dream alive or you have to let go of lot and say lot God bless you we can be friends only at a distance because when we're close my vision suffers when we're close I become negative when we always talk I leave afterwards you're not happy I'm not happy you're not getting closer to Jesus and I'm just being drained and sucked life out of and so I'm just letting you go I'm just want to let you know I need to continue with my life I need to grow I need to see my vision get stronger in Jesus mighty name can somebody say amen, amen. we see that God brings Abraham to a place where he becomes his only source God gives him this vision God gives him this idea that he begins to see now what he heard Lot is removed. Abraham is walking in the vision. Abraham is seeing the vision and then God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham I want you to know that now you are a father of many nations. From this day on you call yourself Abraham. It means you are the father. Call your wife Sarah. She is the mother of many nations. I want you to change your name. I want you to change your identity. You are now a different person. In other words God was saying Abraham you're no longer this person that you used to be you are now a father now the interesting part is Abraham didn't have kids when he became a father nobody becomes a father until they have kids nobody becomes a millionaire until they have a million and nobody becomes a champion until they win nobody become righteous until they do something right in God's world it's everything a little bit opposite you first become successful and then you do good things you first become saved and then you do righteous things you first become happy and then you find relationship in God's world you first get victory and then you go and fight in God's world you first become a father and then you have a child God works a little bit different than the way the world system works in this world you have to first receive you have to first achieve something and then you receive that thing but with God it's a little bit opposite you first receive something from him and then you eventually achieve that thing which you received for us it's very important to understand where we are headed as a church and where you are headed as an individual this the next level of your and my life is dependent on our vision the vision that we have will determine where we're going to be this vision will fuel our prayer and this vision will change our life vision makes you first and then it changes your life before God brought Isaac to Abraham 
God made Abraham a father. He walked like a father for some time and then there came a son. I remember when uh, my wife moved to Tri-Cities some four and a half years ago and after kind of coming to our church I discovered that she struggled, she started to struggle with loneliness. And I quickly said, oh well, because it's a new city, new church, new things, and I'm a youth pastor, it's going to take some time to adjust. And as we started to adjust a year into it, uh, a year and a half into it, um, the loneliness actually increased. With loneliness, right away came nightmares, almost every other night. Sometimes once a week, twice a week, they were very excruciating nightmares. I'm talking about nightmares to the point where I would have to wake up and pray for her as she wakes up in a pool of sweat. And these nightmares were just literally attacking and hurting her and sometimes we would have prayers and afterwards she would come and she would just literally start crying. She was lonely. And well, I started looking for a solution. One solution as I was trying to convince Lana's sister who was her best friend in Vancouver to move to Tri-Cities. Because my wife wasn't lonely in Vancouver. She never had nightmares in Vancouver. She only developed them in Tri-Cities. So so I see this is not the problem but we just need to bring some of the friends here. I was actually trying to set a meeting so that few of her friends will move to Tri Cities who loved our church. The problem is those friends couldn't stand our city though they loved our church. With some I even tried to arrange a date with some of the people in our church. See maybe they could get married and come for this reason and all of my all of my efforts proved abortive. As I started to get to know a little bit more of my wife's family, I realized that it's not something my wife struggles only with. Her mom has the same problem. Even though her mom is an adult, but there's this loneliness that plagues her life. And we started to pray with Lana and I said, Lana, what we must understand is this. You don't need friends to fix this. You have friends. You don't need other people from Vancouver to fix this. That's not going to solve this. This is a spiritual problem. God is the one who will remove loneliness, not your sister. And when we started to pray and we started to come against those even spirit of loneliness and God created a new reality. It didn't happen over one night. It didn't happen over one prayer and it didn't happen in one month. But when the reality inside was changed and she simply just got settled and said, you know what, this is my city. I love my church and God started to remove that loneliness and fill it with his peace. The friends didn't change. Everything was still the same. But when God's process of making her on inside a reality of what she wanted to be was finished, the funny part is this, her sister had moved to Tri-Cities. And different people started to move. Everything started to change. And I was looking at Lana, I remember we were saying this. I'm like, isn't that interesting? When you needed her the most, she didn't want to come. And when God did a miracle of making you someone on his side, you were hoping she could make you. God sent her. Because then God don't want you to rely on her to make you remove loneliness. God wants him to remove that loneliness for you. Can somebody say amen? God will on purpose allow these things. He wants to make us on inside, not something else. And when he changes us on inside, guess what happens? God will begin to do those things in our life for the glory of God. Can somebody say amen? Some of you remember that last weekend during the conference when I shared that and last summer when I came from on camp and we were having a little morning prayer and during the morning prayer I've told our team that I said we need to on Wednesday switch the pulpit from the middle here into the middle of the sanctuary. Because if you watch our older videos, you will find all the videos were recorded with me standing right here and the pulpit standing right here. And one of the reasons we did that is because we had half of the sanctuary somewhat filled and we tried to not look too discouraged when there would be like, you know, seven people spread all around the sanctuary. <laughs> That's how it was for years and years and years. But I said, I have faith already in my heart and I see that our sanctuary will be filled. We will see people come to Jesus but it wasn't filled yet so that Wednesday we switched it and I was nervous but we switched it that same week the Lord also placed in my heart and he said Vlad you're acting like a youth pastor of a very small group you're managing two YouTube channels four podcasts cutting the grass twice at church and you're doing things that an average very small pastor would do and I said, well, Lord, once our church grows and I have people I can delegate, I will stop doing those things. But the problem wasn't with the church. The problem is the small church was inside of my mind. 
and I had to expand that our church in my mind had to be already greater and I had to slowly begin to change how I act before it got anything bigger and that week I remember I sent one YouTube channel to one person one YouTube channel to another and I've delegated everything and some of our leaders looked at me and they said oh, what are you gonna do now <laughs> we're paying you to do something in church what are you gonna do and I said I don't know I said I don't know what big pastors do <laughs> and when I started to pray I found out that my main job is threefold that is to pray to have a vision and to raise up leaders cutting grass is not the highest importance but to pray to have a vision and I remember when I told some leaders they're like what do you mean are you just gonna get paid to sit and watch through the window to have a vision <laughs> to have a vision is one of the hardest things you can have as a person to keep that vision not to be discouraged when things get hard when things don't turn out that is one of the most challenging things it is easy to cut the grass it's easy to clean the toilet it's easy to pick up garbage but to keep a vision alive of higher than what you see today that is not easy but that's what big people must do and I remember when I started to shift you know we started to change some of you saw that during the conference starting today you know we moved the pulpit a little bit higher <laughs> do you know why because in my heart God placed deeply in my heart that it took us 10 years to broke the barrier of 60 people but it's gonna take us 10 months it should take us 10 months to break the barrier of 200 but for that to happen first things have to shift inside I'm not comfortable with this trust me that's why you see me sliding back all the time but I am showing it to you practically what we do as a church and you all of us we have to do it personally you have to always go higher when our service started today and I remember one of the leaders came in they're like you're gonna put, put a pulpit there there's nobody here and I remember during worship I almost wanted to send him a text message like well, let's do it next Wednesday <laughs> but that's not how it works with God you always put a vision first and then you add prayer to it and you will see how God will make the difference can somebody say amen yeah. when you have a vision when you have faith in that vision it's important that that vision will produce acts or works the problem we have sometimes is when we look at somebody who has a vision and we begin to copy their acts of faith instead of imitating the faith that created those acts that was my problem as a young teenager uh, one pastor would send me to different churches in Tri-Cities and he would say meet with all the youth pastors find out what they're doing learn as much as you can and try to implement it at your own church and so each week I had a different system for our church each week I had a different way we're going to do church because I would meet with different youth pastors and my problem was this is I would copy what they did but I did not tr I didn't know the spirit and the attitude that was going on inside of them and all of those things of course none of them lasted none of them brought any lasting result and if it changed the youth ministry a little bit it never changed me as a person and I remember same thing happened about two years ago when I went to Ukraine to this church that that I that I um, that I get inspired by and I went in there and I wanted to study their home groups I wanted to see how they do their home groups when I went in I met somebody and I said hey could you tell me about home groups she's like I don't know how home groups are done I was like I came all the way from the United States to find out how home groups are done and I meet this weirdo who doesn't tell me how home groups are done a week passed and I did not learn how home groups are done I remember coming back and you know and our leaders were asking so what did you learn nothing how do they do their home groups I don't know but you know what I learned some little spark of their faith started to touch me and I found out that the way we do home groups and the way they do home groups that doesn't matter what matters is not copying their acts of faith but imitating the faith that create those acts and each week we change the way we do our home groups we had this during this weekend people came and they're like we want to learn how do you guys do these things that's a wrong way to go because if you copy our acts of faith but you don't copy the faith that creates those acts you will find yourself like Egyptians copying Israelites going into the Red Sea 
Israel is going to the Red Sea because they have faith in God. Egyptians is going into the Red Sea because well Israel is going into it and they get shut down by the Red Sea. Today I want to inspire you to have faith inside. Once you have that faith God will produce acts inside of you. For me the act is moving a pulpit from here to over there. For me the act is to start praying earlier. For me that act is to start changing in my mind, put a billboard in my office and say God 50 home groups. That is my act. A young girl who came from California, she wants to get married. Her act of faith was she brought a ring to my wife and says, I want you to wear this ring. And every time you wear this ring, I'm going to believe that God will give me the same blessing He gave you. He'll give me an awesome man of God. That was her act. I know some people who are trying to get married and they cannot and they simply, a young lady would envision a husband in her mind, went and bought a suit, a very expensive suit, put it into a closet and said Lord will open the closet every day and says God I bless my husband close the closet and go to work <laughs> now some of you will say I'm gonna go do that tomorrow you can't do that because you have to copy her faith and not her technique because many people would hear somebody doing something radical they're like I'm gonna do exactly the same thing it's good it could work if you also copy the faith that they did it with can somebody say amen and this young lady, particular one that I know, what she did, when she would meet her uh, boyfriend at the time, eventually they start going out, they start being friends, and she said, hey, I, I have this suit I want you to try on. <laughs> the surprising part, every part of the suit fit that guy perfectly. And eventually he wore that suit on the wedding day. Now that was her faith. Come on, let's put our hands together. I know some of our guys have a list of 20 things they want to see in a girl and that, that list is very extensive and very intensive and some people say well that's exactly what I want to do. Remember your act of faith is supposed to be fueled by your faith. I can motivate your faith but the works of your faith they come from your faith. Your faith pushes the works. My faith is the one that pushed me to give one car away, second car away. You can't copy that but you can copy the faith that could push you to do other things. Maybe to give somebody a meal, maybe to give somebody a coffee, maybe to pay for somebody as they go to a trip or something. Your faith will create its own works and those works will create a miracle. Can somebody say amen? amen. So we don't copy other people's works of faith. We imitate the faith that create the works. And as you allow your faith, you may say, well, my faith is not leading me anything. Keep feeding it and you will see how your faith will become uncomfortable in your situation and says, hey, push this off. You're like, yeah, I could do that. You push this off, a little bit feel uncomfortable and you begin to see yourself in a new level of your life. Why? Because a faith created a work and the Bible says faith without works is dead. Abraham's faith changed his name. Abraham's faith made him walk in the land that was occupied by someone else. That was his faith. Abraham's faith made him look to the stars and he heard every star says, Father Abraham. When he went discouraged, he looked in the bottom, he saw every piece of sand. He picked it up and he says, these are my Russian descendants who will get saved through Jesus Christ. These are my Mexican descendants who will get saved through Jesus Christ. And these are the people from, from another country. And he, this was his act of faith. If I will go do that today and pick up pieces of rocks and do that, that's not going to be faith. But when I imitate Abraham's faith and my faith pushes me and say, draw a billboard put it in this, do this, then this faith that create those works will bring those works eventually into miracles in my life and in our lives. Can somebody say amen? Did you learn something this evening? Is your faith encouraged? Are you gonna go higher? Are you gonna dream bigger? Can somebody say amen? Can somebody say amen? I told our leaders every single there's coming a day we're believing for it this year but what we've seen on the conference we will see every single Wednesday. This place completely packed we will see few services on Wednesday. We will see a bunch of people being healed, being saved and being touched because this is just the beginning. Why? We serve a big God who has big plans for us and we have a generation who is hungry for God, hungry for love, hungry for miracles and we are that generation. Can somebody say Amen.